Uh, Russell, thanks so much uh, to you and the team for affording me this opportunity to talk to you guys about entrepreneurship, but we're going to be doing a little differently. We're going to be talking about the philosophy of entrepreneurship. Okay, so um, let's just look at what philosophy means. It's pretty easy. Philo means love, and I love philo pastry. That's how I remember it. And sophie means wisdom. So philosophy is the love of wisdom. But we're going to look at a specific subset of philosophy. I'm not a great navel gazer, but I think this is pertinent because there's one of the pillars or one of the roots of philosophy is epistemology. Now, I like epistemology, other than the fact it sounds like I know a fancy word, is that epistemology says, how do you know? What data did you use? How did you arrive at that conclusion? And I like that, because that gives us a sense of honesty. Okay, so it's going to be an honest look at entrepreneurship that we're going to do in the few minutes that I've got with you. So let's look at entrepreneurship, the word. It comes from the English and French. It means to undertake an enterprise. So you have to do something. As a Livingston, the poet says, we judge ourselves by what we're capable of, but others judge us by what we've done. So to be an entrepreneur, you need to do something. So in the, and I think we could all agree that a great example would be Elon Musk. What did he want to do? He wants to put us on Mars. He wants to get us driving electric cars. And he wanted to buy Twitter. Well, see, that's gone in reverse now. But anyway, so he does things. And I think that's a trait that we associate with uh, entrepreneurship. There are some things that stop us doing things, and I'm going to get to that later in the talk. Now, if we go into the history of entrepreneurship, if we look at uh, the 18th century and 19th century, people who were wealthy, if you want to relate that to success, that's fine, or were, you know, lived in these large houses and had these servants and everything else, they were considered nothing more than fortunate. They weren't considered gifted in anything. They weren't considered uh, having any special skills. They were just considered as fortunate to have been born in that specific lineage. And those people that didn't have all those benefits were considered simply as unfortunate. You couldn't choose your parents, and that's what you were born into, and that's how people accepted life. But in the 20th century, that started to change, okay? And we considered people who were unfortunate in, in one sense, if you look at it uh, in the field of entrepreneurship, you know, sometimes the, the word loser is, is bandied about a little too often. But the thing is that a narrative developed about entrepreneurship. And it said, if you're an entrepreneur, you can be successful, you can be independent, you can be master of your own destiny, all these, all these attributes. But so the responsibility of success then fell on the shoulder of the individual. And the only reason we were told that you're not successful is you haven't tried hard enough, you haven't failed enough times, you haven't read the right books, you're not connected to the right people, you haven't found your internal passion or whatever it is. So the responsibility of success has been moved onto the individual. So there is this, this aspiration for a lot of people to want to be entrepreneurial because it gives us that potential sense um, of freedom. But this is an epistemological, epistem, anyway, that word, look at entrepreneurship. So 
we're going to take an honest look at it. So if we look at entrepreneurship, and I look at some of the figures, and look, it's very difficult to analyze success and failure in entrepreneurial ventures because the guys who fail kind of aren't there anymore. So how do you measure something that's not there? But the empirical evidence that we've seen ranges from 30% to 70%. And I think 30% is true at certain times and 70% might be true at other times. Certainly in, uh, um, when we got hit by uh, COVID, it changed um, a lot of organizations and, and uh, especially startups. So, you know, there's this, there's this vision that you can be successful, anybody can be successful. And if you start an entrepreneurial venture, then, uh, and you do the right things, then everything will be okay. Well, it's not okay for 30% to 70% of the people. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at the traits of what makes those entrepreneurs who do succeed successful in terms of the empirical evidence that exists. So I'm going to share those with you. So also we need to understand that most of us are not, well, none of us are, we could think of ourselves as startups, depends how you want to refer to time or how you want to relate your organization to, uh, to time. But most of us are in this group, at least are in something established. So we've got a support system of some sort, and that brings into play what we call entrepreneurship. Okay, and the success rate for entrepreneurship is obviously substantially more. Why? Because you're coming off a base that exists. You're getting support uh, in a large company. Um, you know, if you've got an HR problem, there's an HR department, or in your case, you know, there's somebody who's strong in HR. I can then consult that person if there's finance issues. And so you've got all those resources that independent startups uh, don't really have. But the traits of entrepreneurship then apply to you as it would apply to anybody else. So what are the traits that the research shows are necessary or are correlated with successful outcomes. So the first trait is the ability for people to understand that there is no way you can get rid of uncertainty. You can have an idea about the future, but you can't know the future. So the first thing you have to understand, the first of the three traits, is an ability to appreciate risk. And the risk that comes from a great degree of uncertainty in which we live. So one way that I dealt with uncertainty, and it worked for me when COVID hit us, was what we call real options reasoning. And it's based on like financial options. You, 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 you have an option to buy something, but not the obligation. And that obviously costs you a bit of money. And it's the same thing with innovation. Okay. It's the fact that, yes, I don't have to throw everything out. I can take a look at it. I can maybe develop it to a point. And yes, when it gets to a point where it becomes very expensive and a major outlay, then I have the option of continuing. I have the option of discontinuing. But what people very often forget is they have the option to have learned something during that period. Okay, So real options reasoning is something we must keep in mind because a lot of ideas are stupid. I mean, Uber was a really stupid idea. It went against all the advice your parents had given you, which was never get into a stranger's car. I mean, Google was a stupid idea. I had Yahoo. I didn't need Google with the reverse links and everything else. I thought, you know, but anyway. Um, and Airbnb was also a stupid idea. I mean, who's going to go and stay in somebody else's house? I mean, that's never going to happen. So intuitively, 
these aren't ideas that resonate with us immediately. And that's also why design thinking is quite important. Now, I'm not an expert in design thinking, but I'm going to uh, uh, cover that uh, briefly as well. So the first thing is your ability to embrace risk and to live with it and to work with it and to mitigate it. Okay, you're not going to lose your shit uh, over everything. Then um, the other issue is uh, the other trait, my apologies. The first trait is the ability to embrace risk. The second trait is the ability to innovate. Okay. Now, innovations come from a number of areas. They, you know, you get the shower moment, you get a customer telling you, oh, I wish you could provide this. Uh, you get pain points that you want to innovate. Uh, and usually innovations emanate from a problem. Um, and I'll give you an, one example. Um, when I was quite young, I, I was in a, I just said the right things, I think so. And I, would, I had a, a position and I, they flew me around South Africa and I stayed in hotels and, I, you know, and in the morning you go for breakfast and you go for breakfast and there's this stupid rusted toasting machine. Okay, and you stick your toast on there. Now you've got two choices. You can stand there like an idiot, okay, or having paid 3,000 Rand for your room, or now 4,000 Rand, uh, or you can go and get your eggs and hope nobody steals your toast, right? So that's, that's a pain point. So I have invested, uh, invested, I have invented a vertical toaster for hotels, which everyone laughed at, but two people never laughed at it, and those were two hotel owners said, yes, that it is actually an issue. But um, you also, if we look at design thinking, design thinking, uh, the one uh, uh, step is absolute empathy with your, uh, with your users or your client or whatever it might be. And uh, I certainly had that because I was the user and I, I still stand and wait for my toast. I'm too, I'm too neurotic to go and fetch the eggs. And then somebody's going to either touch my toast or steal my toast. And I, don't, I went on a cruise now and it was the same bloody thing. Okay. I had to stand on a cruise ship waiting for toast. Anyway, sorry, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> I don't know how many people are upset about hotel toasters. The, 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 the cruise guys don't care because they know you can't leave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, you're quite right. Well, so, you know, some people have jumped off cruise ships. I saw it the other day. You, know? <laughs> you can think of it. Somebody's done it there. <laughs> yeah. It's the first time I've ever slept inside a boat. So, you know, that came uh, from a question. But design thinking says it's all right to have the question. That's fine. And it's all right to have an option. But what you need to do is not stop at your first option, which I did when I invented YouTube. Okay, so now I even remember where I invented YouTube. I went for the prawn special in Hat Bay and I was sitting in the restaurant there. And I said to the person I was having lunch with, you know, why don't I put a site up where you can stick your videos and share it with everybody else? And, uh, uh, but I was too focused. I just grabbed the first solution. My first solution was a website called No Docs, K N O W Docs. And it was, uh, something about bringing concepts to life. So you get these very boring articles that are written about something. And the whole thing there was, oh, I'm going to cater to the academic community. And they're going to take these really complicated papers and they're going to make it easy and they're going to put it on no docs. And that was my thing. Whereas YouTube came in and obviously blew me completely out the water because I hadn't looked at all the options. And as human beings and design thinking is based on that principle, okay, that you would normally default to the first solution that you see. And the idea is not to do that. The idea is to find as many solutions that would maybe meet that innovation. Then obviously there's rapid prototyping as well. And then learning from that prototyping, which I never did. Uh, I, I quickly briefed it in, put up the website and then, you know, try to get people to come. And I thought, oh, who's going to film things? So I'll get the camera people to come in. And, and I, so I, I, was, I went in a completely incorrect decision. Had I sat down with people and we iterated and discussed it, um, today maybe I'd be buying Twitter. But anyway, so innovation uh, is the new competitive currency out there. Okay. 
that's what I feel we compete on. Uh, you know, you, you want to start something, you can have it designed overnight and the next morning you can release it. Not a problem. You know, you have a business idea, make the website tonight, tomorrow I'm in business. So it's, so it's about innovation. It's also obviously the other aspects in your specific business it's about relationships, about relationships with, with your clients and obviously filling that pipeline, which we discussed earlier. And I'm going to talk about the one thing that we did speak about earlier, uh, because the third, so the first thing was ability to embrace risk because of uncertainty. The second was a focus on innovation. And the third thing that successful entrepreneurs do is they are proactive. In other words, okay, I've spotted the problem, but as, as, as Livingston said right in the beginning of this talk, we judge ourselves by what we're capable of, but others judge us by what we've done. So, you know, you need to be proactive. You've got this idea. And, you know, very often uh, uh, successful outcomes are based on an idea, but are very often not the original idea that put us, got us into action. Okay, so that's also, it doesn't, you know, this, Thing aiming for perfection is also nonsense, right? Perfection is the great enemy of 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 good, and and sometimes you know uh, I don't think Woolworths are perfect, but you know they're pretty good, and I go there most days. But um, it's about in getting things done, and about being proactive, uh, and that's also um, Russell. You you kind of mentioned the the pain of networking, uh, which I, I do understand and I do appreciate, but um, I, I being proactive also means proactively ensuring that you're making contact all the time to fill that pipeline. Okay, so uh, you know, go to events, and the whole thing is not to expect anything because you don't know. You never know who you're going to bump into. Uh, I mean, the Google is Sergey Brin and what's his name? I mean, they only got together because they happened to attend the same university. You know, a lot of the interactions that we have are serendipitous. They just happen because we happen to do the opposite of leading a depressed life. And a lot of people think the opposite of depression is happiness, but I don't think it is. I think the opposite of depression is vitality. It's the ability to live a life and accept the up and downs and to feel that life is worthwhile. And in that vital life, you come across things that you need to be proactive about. Because if you don't consider your life proactive, uh, uh, vital, you're not going to be proactive. So proactivity was the three things. So just to summarize the, the three attributes that correlate, they might be necessary, but probably not sufficient for successful entrepreneurial outcomes, or in your, our case, intrapreneurial outcomes. Okay, the, things can happen, like you can grow up with a sibling who's very competitive, and that might influence. I, I know a friend who's always in trouble because he's trying to keep up with his brother. So it's this one venture and then the next venture. And, and that is what, uh, uh, it could be a critical parent. That's, oh, you know, you know, I need to make my mark in life. Uh, it could, there, there could be various other factors. So also a, a, a thick skin, because as an entrepreneur, you hear the word no all the time. So that could also be uh, a necessary trait. Um, which traits are totally sufficient for entrepreneurial success? I, I don't really know, and I don't know, I think anybody knows. Uh, but the traits that are necessary are those three, and that is the ability to embrace risk and innovative mindset and to be proactive to actually do something. So just to end off with the words of um, Theodore Roosevelt, he said, it's Hard to fail, but it's worse to have never tried to succeed. Thank you so much.
So now, if there are any questions, please go ahead. Oh, we're six minutes over. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, no problem. I, 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 a lot of what you said resonates so much, and it's been things that I've, in the past two weeks alone, just had conversations on and touched on these different points. Um, but one of these things, out of the three of these that stuck out for me the most is the proactivity. I think um, this also links, the proactivity links with the ability to innovate because uh, when we have an idea or an inkling of an idea, sometimes you know, scratching at it a little bit would reveal a much greater application, a much greater, but because uh, I'm just kind of autopiloting it, I'm, I'm doing my day-to-day -day stuff, the next thing will come about in its own time or organically. It doesn't happen organically. You really have to go and scratch out and feel and ex ex uh, experiment. And, and, I, and I love that. Um, so all of these really resonate with me. And I think um, it's an excellent, excellent talk. Um, anybody else have any questions for Sid? Or want to challenge him on anything? Make him sweat a little bit. Mm, we earn my money here. <laughs> <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. I think you, you, you said your sister was involved in healthcare as well. Um, yeah, we were hit very hard. Uh, I'm lucky. I've been suffering from major depression for 40 years. Well, not suffering. I'm, I've been managing it uh, for 40 years. So I've been managing my mood. Uh, that's natural for me. So when we went into lockdown, I've been managing my mood for years. So I, I had the time of my life. I mean, you can't see if I'm wearing pants. My dog thinks she's gone to heaven. I'm here all the time. The cat thinks I've been fired. Um, my <laughs> wife's here. <laughs> you know, we can have lunch. Uh, so uh, for me, it was an absolute treat. But, you know, for a lot of the people who've never focused on managing their mood, yo, mm -hmm. I was on the phone to the psychiatrist and then the admissions department. And, you know, and I got in Professor Stoffel Grobler. I worked a lot with him. Uh, the psychiatrist uh, from Stellenbosch, and I actually speak on mental, uh, on well-being as well. I mean, I'm not a healthcare practitioner, but um, mm. I came up with the two METS acronym, uh, which uh, they actually contacted the, me, uh, Stellenbosch University, and they asked if they could please use that acronym in the lectures to the, uh, the, the mental wellness lectures to the um, author, uh, the OTs. Um, oh. And I said, oh, mine, no, I use it with pleasure. You know, I mean, it's going to quote me. But anyway, so um, that is, has also um, been, an in and I've got a talk on the internet. You can just search Sid Pema Pecha Kucha uh, is my mental health well uh, uh, wellness talk. Okay. Uh, but that, that's become a big issue. But, you know, it's a lot of misinformation. And, uh, but I, I want to so I see that you wanted to say something and I just jump in quickly before you do. Is that okay? Um, oh, okay. So, some, so something that resonated with me is, um, you know, not, um, in, and especially we find this in research. So um, as you were thinking, because um, I'm a social behavioral scientist as well, um, it really appealed to me because it makes sense. It's like step by step what we do in research, right? Um, so the one thing not stopping at the first option. So there's a part of research that or specific focus in research that we call implementation science. So there's a problem, a defined problem. And then you sort of, as you see things and develop things, um, you adapt accordingly. So at the end of the study, you track your steps and you're like, oh, this was the beginning of the problem. This was the initial solution. And then we shifted all the way and then you sort of see the impact of your product and all of those things. So um, it's so interesting for me because I'm thinking, okay, I'm sitting with all of this knowledge. I do want to translate it into a business. Um, but how to from here? So that, you know, got me thinking. So thank you for that. It was a, it was a good point of connection for me. Great. Robin, uh, which business are you in at the moment? So at the moment, I'm doing consulting on smaller projects. Because I'm a registered counselor, I am doing debriefing on smaller projects. So that's in studies where there are vulnerable populations. Um, I sort of tend to the psychological management and needs around that. Okay. Yeah. 
And then where are you yes. based? Uh, Woodstock. Oh, so you're in town? Yeah. Oh, so if you want some contacts in that field, uh, give me a shot and we can do coffee. Oh, thank you. Decaf, since you were speaking about caffeine poisoning. Yes, no, I, I, have, <laughs> I have three and then I switch to decaf. Um, and then oh, at about okay. five o'clock, if I still need to churn out work, I, I have another one. But um, okay. yeah. Good system. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, but only with pleasure. If you want to chat, I've uh, been yeah, involved with Cognacity, um, mm. uh, mainly the UK based ones, which have got representation in South Africa. Um, but that's become a field. And you see, at the corporates in the corporate world, mental health has, has always been, uh, has always had a stigma. I mean, we refer to things like burnout. Now, burnout, yeah. there's no such condition as, as burnout in the medical literature, okay? Yeah. It either manifests as depression, anxiety, or whatever. But we, why do we call it burnout? Because burnout says, I work too hard. You made me work too hard. There's nothing really wrong with me. You know, so it's, it's kind of, uh, 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 but I think people are starting to embrace it a little more openly now. I don't know if it's because I'm involved in the, in it that I see <laughs> first, you know, so really? don't, it's the fact I'm seeing what I feel comfortable mm -hmm. about, uh, or uh, maybe it is uh, becoming a much more prevalent. Sorry, Robin, I'm think, on and on about my favorite topic. No, no, no. I, I think it's because it's been rebranded, right? We don't speak about mental health so much, we speak about wellness. Wellness. Um, so there's also that. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, Russell, sorry, I rambled on a bit. Too. No, 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 no. I, I, um, you guys clearly have something going on there, so I didn't want to say anything. Just raise my hand for when you're ready. Um, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is a little bit maybe off-center, but for, for I think very relevant for, for this group of people who's on here today. So we've got these very competent people um, who have decided we are going to go into business this is the solution that we're bringing to the market. This is the service that we're bringing to the market. Now, it's a matter of stepping up into this because all of us, if I look at each of us in this group, we in the 1800s and 1900s would have been classified as the unfortunate. We weren't born into connection or anything like that, right? So now we are competent. Now the networking part comes in. Right now, maybe because of your consulting background, I, I, I would like for you to kind of walk us through how you effectively and maybe at scale even uh, enter this kind of space, this, this arena and fill that pipeline in a tasteful way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Um... Okay, so the way I do it is I have a rule, uh, and no one doesn't see me. Actually, the only guy who hasn't answered my mail is Cyril. Um, but otherwise, uh, there's no such thing as you don't see me. Okay? Uh, that's not an option. Uh, so it's a naive view, and it's a, a bit of an unrealistic view, but it, it works for me, okay, as, as a perspective. It, no one shouldn't see. It's the same with Steve Jobs. He phoned up uh, uh, Mr. Packard and he said, listen, have you got some spare parts lying around? And he said, sure, come and fetch them. So you, you, you've got to, and but, you know, just approach people with a reason. Don't approach them asking. I sometimes get people who approach me and just ask for help generally. Help me in my career. Well, okay, get going. I mean, you know, um, it's like, you know, world's your oyster, go for it. Is, you know, so you need to approach, if you want to approach coal. I approached uh, 91 this morning, which is the new uh, Investec um, uh, subsidiary. And uh, the way I approached them was um, in Daily Maverick, they had a banner. And the strategy on the banner was completely incorrect from my perspective. So I just phoned them up. I said, who's your marketing director? And they, I said, what's his email? And they gave me the email. And I sent a very nice email. I, I can actually share it with you. I sent it this morning. 
Uh, let me find it. I'm just share screen. Um, now, whether you'll answer me or not, has he answered me? No. But there's some people that I, I, I emailed out of the blue. They don't know me from Adam. And like the, C, the new CEO of Maersk, um, I knew somebody used to work there, but he didn't know him. And I said, listen, this guy, I had a chat. He said, I could maybe add some value. You don't know him. Would you be prepared to meet with me? And he said, sure. So then his secretary set up a Zoom presentation. I said, no, I'd rather come through. So they canceled the Zoom and now it's a face-to-face -face meeting uh, next week. Uh, what I'm going to talk about, I don't know, because I don't really know their business. But at least uh, I'm in with a chance. So let me show you what I sent this morning uh, when I saw that silly advertisement that they put in Daily Maverick. Uh, sent, well, Koti Basson, I'm showing me. And let me just share screen. And you can see, and then I'm going to talk about some of the research in networking. We're going to talk about SWTs and structural holes, which are important concepts that you need to know. So just give me a chance to share screen. There we go. Okay. Uh, can you see it says, Dear Kuti? Uh, maybe I don't know if I can make it bigger. Uh, can you read it, or do you want me to read it to you? I can read it. I okay. Can read it okay. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, you'll you might tell me to get lost, but you know. Good strathering in the chamber of commerce there. Straight I'll tell there. you now why I did that. <laughs> it wasn't my idea. It wasn't my idea at all. I'll tell you why I did it. Just let me know when you guys are finished. Okay, I'm done. Okay, so nice. maybe you'll get back to me, maybe you won't. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, uh, there I spotted, I've done that a number of times where it has worked. I'm just trying to think. Um, you know, sometimes you, you're proactive. Like uh, I was sitting with the founder of Mr. Delivery and there was a, a piece of cardboard from a hotel and there was a magnet on the back of this piece of cardboard. So I said, why don't we put it on the Mr. Delivery booklets? So he said, that's a great idea. So we called in the printers and the printer said, absolutely not. It's the wrong paper stock. We don't put magnets on the back of books. So I thought, oh, okay, that's all I needed to hear. So I found a magnet manufacturer in Cincinnati. Lawrence and I climbed on an airplane, bought a million magnets, and we came back. And then I said, well, why don't we put an advert on the front now? Because this is on everyone's fridges. So, um, you know, it was about being pro proactive. So the reason I mentioned Chamber of Commerce is... I've got somebody who's cold calling for me. Okay, not they send an email and say, you know, are there are courses and things that I can do for you and whatever. Uh, it's just another route. I, I don't depend on it, but it's nice to know some. While I'm sitting and chatting to you, somebody's phoning on my behalf. Uh, of course, VA is a big business today, virtual assistants. So uh, she said to me, Sid, uh, uh, I need what I'm using as an introduction is that you have just stepped down as the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce because people can relate to that, okay? It gives you some credibility as opposed to no one's heard of SIP payment, no one's heard of strat planning, okay? So that's why, so I thought, you know, that's a bloody good idea. So I lead with that now as well. Um, you know, so that, that's, so it's a base from which to judge me, okay? A lot they, they couldn't fire me for seven years, so I must have been able to add some value. Okay, so let me talk about uh, the networking. Okay, so the, uh, so the one thing is time is not money, which I've told you before. The other thing is nobody doesn't see you, okay? Um, the other two uh, theories that you do need to know, one is SWT, which is the strength of weak ties. And that was actually discovered in the 70s or the 80s by a chap called Mark Granovetta, okay? And he's the father of modern network theory. And the strength of weak ties, he researched a number, 
uh, his uh, respondents were people looking for jobs at some stage in their lives. And he then looked at how they did their job search. And he found that those job searchers who were utilizing weaker ties were more successful than those who are using strong ties. A strong tie is your family, uh, your close friends, um, your colleagues, and weak ties are people that, yo, you know, I knew this guy about 20 years ago, or uh, actually somebody contacted me the other day, they were looking for a job. And I last spoke to him about 15 years ago. And I met him at Bootleggers, and we had a coffee, and a long chat for about an hour and a half. Whether I get any benefit from it, I don't know. The benefit I got was he told me about this organization and the problems that we're, they were having. So I learned, I learned something. But I just enjoy, you know, you know. So I sent out. You sent out CVs. I said, "Yo, I sent out three. So I said, "It doesn't work, okay, bro. You're only in the game when you hit a hundred, right? The world has changed. You know, hundred CVs and weak ties. Okay, that's it. Otherwise, you're not going to find a job. So. Uh, unless you're going to rely on luck. But, you know, luck's not a strategy. So, um, yeah, so SWT, strength of weak ties, really, really important, not only for, well, for getting a job, but in all the meanings of what a job means, getting a client to give you work, strength of weak ties theory, very ignored. But ah, that, if there's one thing that I can leave you with is, is that the other uh, um, theory came out with a guy called Bert. I don't know what his first name is. A, a number of years after Granovetta's theory. And he came up with a theory of structural holes. And how he arrived at structural holes was that he researched a number of tech companies. And he found that those uh, um, uh, executives in the tech companies who broke out of their circle who never spoke to the same people all the time, okay, but broke out of their circle, got into other circles, were more successful. And the reason they were more successful is you get fresh information in those other circles. What's going around in our circle? The same information. It's the same different day, okay? It's the same stuff that's going around. If you have structural holes in your organization, it makes it, what would be a structural hole? Well, belonging to a church group, okay? It's a completely different circle. Um, be, you know, uh, uh, having a, a contact with people in other sectors, okay? So if you can leverage your weak ties and can set up structural holes, what are the other two things I said? Is time is not money and no one doesn't see you. Um, gosh, there's a talk in there. Um, actually, I'm giving that talk next week at uh, ORT in Cape Town on uh, networking. Uh, the, it's, it's a live, it's face-to-face. -face. Okay. Uh, it's called uh, You Are Not Alone, The Art and Science of Networking. So, uh, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and combine that with the traits that we covered, proactiveness, mm -hmm. innovation, Okay, and innovation brings freshness to a relationship, and that's also what people look for. This, yeah. this person's different, you know, and yeah. um, that's uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, so that's my I was going to say brief answer, but that's my answer to your networking question or filling the I pipeline. That, yeah. I think that's powerful. I think that uh, being bold enough to kind of just reach out to somebody because a lot of time I think we think, oh, we don't want to bother that person. I haven't said hi to them in like five years, mm. uh, you know. But actually, a lot of the time, that is where the opportunities lie and where it's just, yeah. just the right link. Yeah, but so you I'm, don't connect with a general, I just want to connect with you. You don't yeah. connect with, oh, I, I'm really impressed with what you've done. I'd like to learn. You, you go in with a, a reasonably focused ask. My mm -hmm. ask at the moment ends with, can I meet with you? Okay, mm -hmm. And everything prior to that builds up to as briefly as possible a reason to meet mm -hmm. very good very clear thank you so much sid um sid will have to go soon um is there anybody that has a direct question um 
for him. Nobody? Okay. So I think that's it. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I've, I think I've made four pages of notes here. <laughs> I'm going to apply. So, so I think I might also quote you on LinkedIn once or twice from this. Oh, please do. And you must like my articles on LinkedIn, please. I don't think anyone reads them. I wrote a brilliant article on creating shared value. So I don't know. I will. Maybe, I will. maybe the only person who enjoys it is me. <laughs> After after this, I will definitely. Uh, I will definitely. Oh, so, oh so thank, thank you, you thank you. Mm. Yeah, cool, Sid. Thank you so much again. Um, this has really been a great investment of time, and um, yeah, I don't know what else to say, but thank you. Oh, you're most welcome, Russell. And then related to our conversation, there is an article that you might find uh, uh, interesting that I did put on LinkedIn about implementation and the uh, or strategy implementation failure. Um, okay. It's quite a recent article, but that relates to what you're also talking about. Awesome. Okay, perfect. Okay, but it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. And I might if have scored a coffee meeting, but... Uh, hmm. <laughs> if there's anything said that, that we at the at African Research Group can do for, for you, um, our door is open. So please feel free to reach out and... Uh, Hopefully, the, the, the weak tie that was uh, tapped into here will become a stronger one. So, Oh, I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. Um, so if anybody has a problem that you encounter, if you can just recall, the Paul Yo-Yo champion might be the guy who can help you. Uh, I will not. Just, just refer you. And it's so easy to remember. Uh, strat planning is short for strategic planning. So it's stratplanning.com. Yes. Perfect. Cool. So, Thank you, Thank, so you so Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much for your time. All the best. Thank you. Yes. Bye. 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 Bye.